Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the next installment in our 2021 Common Ground and Speaker Series presentations. It has been an incredible uh, year so far, and we are so grateful that for this fiscal year, starting from July 1st through June of next year, we've had two wonderful partners uh, who have given us past grants, but came forward with grants to make our Common Ground programming possible. We wanted to give a special shout out to the Maryland Humanities and the Maryland Heritage Area Authority for believing in the work that we are doing. Um, my name is Nancy Eastling. I am the Executive Director of Historic Soderly, and it is my honor to be part of this tonight. Uh, many of you are already have been obviously with us before. You are already signing into the chat to let us know where you are from. If you are doing that, we if you have not joined us before, please do that. And do know that chat is where you will also put your questions for tonight, of which I'm sure you will have many because you are going to be enthralled. Before I turn the floor over to Jeannie Pirtle, our Director of Educational Programming and Partnerships, I just want to give a special thank you to our guest tonight. She is who somebody I consider a dear friend. Two decades ago, she was a trustee of Historic Soderly as well and led Soderly through a very transformative time in its past. She is always one of our strongest advocates. She never stops believing and, and caring about this organization. And I am so honored to be uh, to, for this organization to be hosting her tonight. You are going to love her as much as I do. And Jeannie does. And let me tell you, you're going to wish you had had a college class with her before we are done. So no further ado, let me turn the mic over to our wonderful Director of Educational Programming and Partnerships, Ms. Jeannie Colonel. Hi, everyone, and welcome, Julie. Julia King is Professor and Chair of Anthropology at St. Mary's College of Maryland, where she researches, writes about, and teaches Chesapeake and Atlantic world history, archaeology, and culture. King is past president of the Society for Historical Archaeology, SHA, an international organization of professional archaeologists. From 2003 until 2011, she served as a presidentially appointed expert member on the U.S. Advisory Council on Historic Preservation, a federal agency advising the president and the Congress on matters of national historic preservation policy. In 2018, King received the SHA's J.C. Harrington Award for her scholarly contributions to the field of historical archaeology. Thank you for joining us, uh, Dr. King, and I'll give you the floor. All right, thank you so much. And I assume everybody can hear me um, and let me know if you can. I'm going to start the slides. And I want to thank you, Jeannie, for that lovely introduction and also Nancy and, uh, and Historic Soderly for inviting me to share um, some of the archeological discoveries that my staff and students and I unearthed at Soderly in 2019 and 2020. Uh, we had generous support from the Soderly staff and also from the Maryland Historical Trust. Um, we were able to collect really important information about Soderly and about life in 18th and 19th century Southern Maryland. So I'm really excited to share the findings I'm with you and I'm grateful for the opportunity to do so this evening. So we're gonna hope for no operator error and, um, and let's see if this works. Oh my gosh, it works. Um, now for those of you who may not be as familiar with Soderly, um, because I don't completely know who this in the audience, but you should know that it is an extraordinary, extraordinary public history site. Um, and it's located on the Patuxent River in St. Mary's County, Maryland. And if you haven't been there in per person, you should definitely make an effort to do it. Um, today, the uh, historic Saturday includes about 100 acres of its original 2000 acre extent. And Soderley has played a really important role in Maryland and American history. Um, and it continues to, by the way, um, it really does. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, the property was home to Native Americans for centuries. Uh, this is an image of John Smith's map of 1608, 
And in the close up to the right, where you can see the red um, circle, you can see the town of, and I always butcher this, but I think it's pronounced Aquatitanixa. Um, the scale on the map makes it difficult to place this town directly on Soderley's 100 acres today, um, but we are confident that it is in the vicinity. And the archeological findings did in fact reveal indigenous habitation along the waterfront. By 1699, James Bowles, who was a wealthy merchant, had acquired the property. And in 1703, according to tree ring dating, um, he had built himself a pretty modest earth fast hall and parlor house. You can see a hall and parlor house. It's a two room house with a loft above. And he's a pretty wealthy uh, guy. And so, you know, but he's building a house like most everybody else. He was a planter. He was involved with the Royal African Company and with the labor of enslaved people, he was building wealth for himself. And in 1715, tree ring dating tells us that he adds on to the back, the new room or what some people might call a back room. Um, and then the house, which passed into Plater and later Briscoe and then Satterley families, continued to be enlarged, growing somewhat or organically along the ridge on which it sits. Um, until assuming the form uh, that is so familiar to us today, those of us who've been out to Soderley. Um, but while the Soderley Mansion is an amazing survival of early architecture, and it really is because it is a, it was a earth fast, that is it sits on post or it sat on post directly in the ground and it was mostly frame. Um, it's not the only survival. Um, many of you are familiar with the 1840s quarter for enslaved families. Um, and truly a preservation miracle that this building survives. There are not many of these types of buildings um, left in Southern Maryland or even in the entire state of Maryland, uh, and especially those that are open to the public. And then there are also support structures such as this late 18th century necessary or privy in the garden. This one is made of brick. Um, and so it's really a kind of colonial bling, you know, to have your privy made of brick. Um, and, uh, and speaking of bling, the landscape itself survives, um, and you can see in this slide the terracing in the garden on the east edge. And of course, as an archaeologist, I absolutely love the landscape. So speaking of archaeology, which is the reason for our gathering this evening, um, I'd like to emphasize to my students that archaeological information is as important as documentary evidence for getting at what happened in the past. It's, it doesn't necessarily stand alone, but then neither does documentary evidence. Um, and in fact, some people would argue that archeological evidence is more reliable than documentary evidence. After all, people who couldn't read or write or people who could read or write and didn't have the time to leave behind writings, um, they all still leave, left material evidence in the ground. So it becomes sort of a, a forensics exercise. Now, as you can see by this fragment of um, oyster shell off to the right, I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, but in the lower right of that slide that just, or the image that just came up, you can see a piece of oyster shell. Nothing really to write home about, but it tells us somebody was there. And then in the middle of that slide, there's a linear brown thing, and that is a cut nail. And the cut nail, cut nails were made, well, up into the 20th century, but we can look at that nail and know that that's a 19th century nail. And then the oyster shell says, hey, somebody was here. Um, and it can tell us about what people did on Southerly. All people, including not just the owners, but the enslaved people who work there. Um, and I should point out that for a site like Southerly, even the wealthy residents, the free people who enjoyed more free time than their enslaved workers, they left really few records. It's, it's really kind of surprising that there's not more. As we screen the dirt, you can see the screen in the background. We find bits and pieces of this evidence, kind of like what I call uh, archeological DNA, um, it, but it's a piece of ceramic. Um, and it says that someone was here. They didn't just get here by, you know, dropping from the sky. Um, the person who's holding this uh, ceramic is holding a stoneware ceramic vessel, probably from a stoneware jug that dates to the 18th or 19th century. And of course, everything that we do is really carefully recorded. 
And I want you to look at this hole before we move on too much. You can see that it's a hole, it's about a foot in diameter. You can see a flag off to the left. So all of these uh, holes, we dug these holes across the property. I'll show you a map in a little bit. We screened the dirt that came out of the hole and then we recorded it. And you can see the woman who was running the project for us out there. She's writing down the soil layering. She describes the artifacts. And to her left, which would be our right, You'll see a little book there. It's, it's kind of washed out, but that's a Munsell soil color book. Um, and so everything we do has to be carefully recorded. Archaeology is just as destructive as a bulldozer that comes through for a new housing development. The difference is, though, is that we carefully record everything so that the next person who comes behind us can evaluate what we find, whether that's a student, an archaeologist, a descendant, whoever they will be able to look and see what, what we saw. Um, and so anyway, I'm gonna come back to the shovel test because that's gonna be our source of information for what I, I'm gonna be telling you about tonight. So th that kind of brings us to the real meat of tonight's presentation, what we found. And we found a lot. It was a real challenge for me to think about how I was going to share with you all the findings that we made, you know, with students, they're trapped, they can't get away. So you can just go drone on and on, but I can't do that in a webinar. So like, what would I, what would I, what would, what would you all find really interesting? Should I talk about the garden, which was one of the highlights of a visit to Satterley, relating that archeological evidence suggests that this space was a garden from the earliest days of Satterley's colonial occupation. Sometimes we refer to this as a colonial revival garden, um, put in in the 20th century, but it actually appears to overlie an earlier garden. Um, or should I talk about the scattered fragments of late 17th century uh, artifacts on the property's north end that we found behind the necessary sort of um, kind of seeping over into the uh, next door neighbor's property? I mean, these are late 17th century materials. We know James Bowles is there in 1699. He does not build that house until 1703. Where is he for those four years? And we got a few really early artifacts that suggest it might be there. So should I talk about that? Um, and then I thought, well, maybe I'll talk about the native settlement located in the far eastern part of the property along Soderley Creek, all the way down there at the end by the tree line. After all, indigenous history is always of great interest to uh, audiences. And we found a site here that looks exactly like a native site on the opposite side of the river, a site that we know archeologists call the Cumberland site. Um, and the fact that they're so similar suggests that for them, the Patuxent River was more Main Street than it was barrier like it is for us today. So should I talk about that? So in the end, given time limits, um, I decided to take my presentation in the direction of the enslaved people who lived at Soderley between 1699, maybe even a little earlier, um, and 1864, when the Maryland Constitution um, frees enslaved people. And I thought that this would be a great way to recognize the, and this is a mouthful, the contemporary international underground railroad communities selection recently of historic Soderley for the Railroad Community's 2021 Free Press Prize for um, Leadership. And, uh, and so I thought, well, I'm going to riff on that. So if there's one thing that our historic Soderley has set the bar for, not just in Southern Maryland, but throughout the state, it's using Soderley to probe American history in service of the present. Uh, they do it without the kind of security that county, state, or federal operating funds provide, and they do it really well. Uh, and it's important to see, I think, how archaeology helps to understand that history. I'm going to take a swig of water here. I am attached to my water bottle. Quick history lesson, tell my students, don't ever put words on a slide if you want to lose your audience, but I kind of had to do it here. It's not many of these slides that are going to have this, but got to have that sort of the history lesson to get a sense. Soderley historians have been able to call numbers of enslaved uh, people from the various records that survived for the plantation. 
So you can see that Satterley's owners benefited from enslaved laborers from James Bowles, um, and he dies in 1727. And we know uh, that there are 23 enslaved persons at Bowles Home Plantation. I see I missed a space in there. Um, uh, and uh, from 1699 until 1864, when slavery is outlawed in Maryland. And as many as 90 people, and there are probably more from time to time um, at Southerly. So this gives you a, a sense that, that um, slavery was a real thing um, on this, uh, this property. Um, and where these individuals lived, besides a standing cabin, and I know most all of you have been to Southerly know the standing cabin. Um, and that standing cabin wasn't built until 1840. And so, you know, that's over 100 years, um, almost 150 years. Where did the other people live? Um, and by the way, this cabin was located right outside a Satterley mansion um, where the Satterley kitchen is today. And oh, I would just love that this building survived. I have to tell you that oral history has been invaluable in locating 11 other cabins for a total of 13. And a big shout out to the late Mrs. Agnes Kane Callum um, for her impeccable genealogical work that has paved the way for all the work certainly that I've done. And also a big shout out to Sam Baldwin, whose relentless effort, when he told me he was gonna be working on this oral history project, I thought you'll never finish. Not only did he stick with it, he finished it, and he documented and assembled uh, Satterley's oral histories. It's an amazing accomplishment, and it allowed my crew and me to build this map that you see. And these little white dots show where oral history places um, a lot of the, uh, the cabins for enslaved people. And some of them are, of course, off of the current property because Satterley was a much bigger place. Um, but the buildings in this map are really more recent. They're post 1800, I would suspect. I can't be a, really sure, but I suspect that most of them are post 1800. But they do give you clues to how enslaved people were distributed across the landscape. And so while surveillance was a big thing in Chesapeake slave plantations, you can tell based on this distribution that not everyone could be, could be surveilled 100% of the time. And if we look carefully, we can see in the records many instances of what George Plater might have considered breaking the law, but that if you're not being surveilled 100% of the time, you're going to take an, an, the opportunity that you get. Um, but that uh, George Plater might have thought it was breaking the law, but self-emancipating self -emancipating people would have called it resistance. Um, running away self-emancipating was very risky business. Um, and as you can see in these runaway ads, um, under, it's mostly undertaken by men um, because it's very dangerous. It's extremely risky. And so you see mostly single men um, or, or men running away alone. Very rarely do you see uh, couples or even families. There's an instance with Josiah Henson in Montgomery County it's absolutely phenomenal that he and his wife and four children did not get caught before they crossed into Canada. Um, so, uh, so perhaps the most uh, interesting self-emancipation event took place in 1814 um, when Vice Admiral Alexander Cochran issued a proclamation offering freedom to Maryland slaves who would enlist with the British forces during the War of 1812. Um, and they would become settlers in British territories. And many Marylanders, many enslaved Marylanders and their families seize the uh, chance for freedom and they join the British. A uh, project I worked at down in St. Mary's City, there were, I believe, 19 people, 30 more people here, 48 people, astonishing. Um, they made their way off a Satterley plantation to British naval vessels that were anchored in the Patuxent. But the question becomes, where did these men, women, and children live? And what were their lives like? And the circumstances of their escape, all of that has been lost. All we know is from the record that they, that they left and that their descendants um, are either in Nova Scotia or in the, uh, in the Caribbean. Um, at least they were lost until archeology span stepped in. So 
let me give you the obligatory archaeology slide. Now, some of these maps, I will be the first to admit, are worse than words on a slide, right? Um, because you kind of go like, whoa, what's going on? But you have to be, you have to become a bit of an archaeologist to understand what's going on. So I'm going to explain this slide a little bit and then we'll um, we'll move on. You'll you'll understand how we're looking at this data. Um, so let me do this next slide. Remember the shovel test. Remember the circular holes. So we would, you know, we if you go to a, an archaeological park like Historic St. Mary City or Jefferson Patterson Park, you'll see them usually excavating larger five by five foot uh, test units. And that's what you do when you already know you have a site. Um, but if you want to figure out what site you have on your property, you don't have the kind of time or funding to dig these five by five. So we use, archaeologists use what's called shovel test. And we excavate them every 25 to 50 feet. Each one of these little crosses represents one of those shovel tests. In this area, they've been dug at 50 foot. Can you all see my cursor? Maybe Nancy or somebody could tell me if you all could see my cursor. No, we cannot see your cursor. All right. So if you look over to the left, you'll see um, that there are these little crosses. In, the red boundaries are solderly today. And, you'll, and you can also see the solderly buildings. You can see the parking lot. You can see the tree lines. And then those little crosses, of which there are many. Um, each one of those represents a shovel test. On the left side of the slide and across the bottom, you see numbers. This grid is on what we call Maryland State Plain. The state of Maryland has a big grid that overlays it. So anybody can relocate what we've done. This is part of our intensive recording process. You'll notice that we, these little crosses are everywhere. If you look, some of them are more grayed out. Others are more robustly black. The ones that were grayed out were, were excavated I think in 1995 by an archaeologist named James Harmon. And if you look, you can see he did around the historic core. He did some of the fields. Um, but Sonderly has acquired more land since then. And so part of our work was to get in there and finish that survey. And I'm really proud of Sonderly because I will tell you that I'm pretty sure that Sonderly is the only public institution in Southern Maryland that has finished its what we call, what we would call if we were on base, the gate to gate survey. Um, and so this is this is actually pretty, uh, pretty impressive. Um, so each one of those crosses represents one of those shovel tests. You can dig, a good crew person can dig 10 of those in a day. So when you have a couple thousand of those to dig, 10 in a day is pretty good. Um, so our next map that we're going to go to looks just like this, except it's the 18th century artifacts. And these blue diamonds represent the 18th century artifacts. So you can see them. And I'm hoping that you all can see where the main house is. The main house is sort of that long linear house in the middle of the slide, sort of close to the red line at the, at the top. And you can see the driveway coming down and um, you can see the little outbuildings around it. Um, and you can see the quarter going down. If you can you orient yourself, you can see the rolling road. You can head on down and you can see the quarter along there. And then you can see the bar and the parking lot. Um, and each one of these diamonds represents an 18th century site. And you'll notice that there are a lot of them around the main house, which is no shocker there, right? Because the house was built in 1703. If you look over to the right and at the top of the, sort of near the north end of the, um, the red line, you'll see a cluster sort of far away from the house. That is a weird 18th century site. I have no idea what it is. I don't think it's a quarter for enslaved people. It's maybe part of some landscaping that Bowles did. Um, we've only done shovel testing. So these are the kinds of questions at the next phase um we would try to address but there's definitely an 18th century site down there um and then if you look um there's concentration here and this is very interesting because this is not great land this is if you've been over in this area you know it's wooded it is a ravine area it's very hilly and it's dissected by ravines 
And this is sort of standing on the edge of one of those ravines and you're kind of, camera didn't do a great job of capturing what I want to illustrate here. These are steep ravines. You, to get down them, you have to find a, an area where the grade isn't so steep where you have to slide down on your backside. And we were finding artifacts on the sides of these slopes. Um, and then, we, and there were flat areas as well too. And so that was really cool. It's like, well, if these are 18th century domestic artifacts. We know where the bowls and the platers are living and they're not living here. So this in fact may be where the enslaved people who were working for the bowls and the platers um, uh, into the early 19th century were living. So we were very excited about that. And then more science. <laughs> there will be a final exam at the end. Um, there's a certain ceramic type called uh, pearlware. Um, and you can see a couple of fragments in the, um, in the uh, little inset. We know that pearlware was manufactured between 1780 and 1820. It's really distinctive. If you're an archeologist, you can pick a fragment up right away and you can see it's got a bluish cast to it. These have a green decoration on them, but if you turn them on their back, they have, um, there's a bluish cast to it. And that's because they add cobalt to the glaze to make it uh, whiter. And if you look at the distribution by the little blue diamonds of pearlware, you see that the pearlware is, um, well, there's concentration around the main house. Again, no shocker. You can see that there's some here as well, too. And we know pearlware is made up into the 1820s. And we also see a little concentration here, which we did not see with the 18th century stuff. So um, we go back real quick, and I hate going back, but I'm going to go back. Oh my God. You can see in that one area to the south, there's no 18th century stuff. But if we go here, we see it here, and then we see it here. So we can, that looks like it's a plater occupation quarter after 1780. And then over in that ravine area, that first circle, that larger circle, we, we think there's at least three and maybe four or five uh, cabins over there. Um, and then something really interesting happens. If you look at whiteware, and whiteware is a ceramic that is first made about 1820. And you'll see that whiteware is located around the main house, no shock there. And in that Southern area, let me see if I've got some, uh, it looks like I've got some uh, um, circles to show you there. And that first larger red circle, you'll notice that there's not much whiteware. There certainly is not the concentration that we saw before, which is really interesting. The site to the South in the circle appears to have a lot of whiteware. And then we see some whiteware over around the slave uh, quarter, which lets us know that that 1840 date is probably right. Maybe it should be pushed back even 10 or 20 years. And then another one in this area. So this is how we're sort of, it's like, a, it's like archeological, like I said earlier, DNA. But what's really interesting about here, it has almost disappeared from the area around uh, the ravine. Um, and what this suggests to me, this map is very interesting. It suggests that in that where that larger red circle is, is that there's a major abandonment event. And there's also a major realignment of quarters, right? Suddenly there are quarters along the rolling road. Um, I believe that that abandonment event is linked to the self-emancipation of enslaved families. Um, and I think that the realignment is how the planter family responded to that. Um, the families that left probably knew that ravine by heart. And you can see the blue lines where the streams at the bottom of the ravines, um, 48 people had to creep through that ravine. Think about that, 48 people uh, and almost half a mile to waiting ships in the, in the Patuxent absolutely remarkable. And you never see people housed up here again. And I think that that is by design. Um, so um, I, I think that that's a really important discovery that there are these 18th century quarters. 
that they are probably linked to that self-emancipation event. And that now that we know that we're th they're there, we can start to develop research questions about how did these individuals live and how in fact did they get to the patoxin? Um, and I suspect it was through the ravine. So let's go to uh, some other things that we found out with the, um, with the quarter or with the enslaved lives at Soderley. What about the standing quarter? Um, there was work that was done there in the 90s. And part of our work was not just to go out and finish a shovel test, but it was to go back and look at what people had done before to see, to sort of reanalyze it, you know, 25 years later. Do we know more? Can we say more about this stuff? And so the woman who worked on this project, her name was Jessica Newworth. And they were getting ready to stabilize um, the quarter in the 90s. I think they had a grant from the trust or somewhere. Um, and so she and her crew, this is one of her crew, went out there. And I want to talk about an unusual feature that she found in front of the west door. Uh, she's, this is an image that she took. These are images are at the Maryland Archaeological Conservation Laboratory now. And it looks like she or the photographer is standing in the doorway taking a picture of this woman, woman who is uh, uh, collecting soil and you can see the oyster shells there. And then if you look at this image, this is a plan of the quarter. You can see the solid black line with the chimney. This is just a plan, right? And so you've got some, you've got some sea legs now looking at the plan uh, from the other one. And you'll see these uh, un these uh, squares with hatching. That hatching is um, the uh, that's those are excavation units. And the woman was digging that you just saw the picture of. She was digging in these two units. So you can see that there's been a lot of work around that cabin, and there is much to say. Um, but because we don't have all night, although you know I could talk about this all night, so you know we can stay if you want. Um, uh, but I'm going to give you sort of the, the, the cliff notes, the really interesting stuff that we found. Um, here is a close up. You can see the quarter. North is to the left. The west side is to the bottom of the slide. And the image to the right is actually the wall of the quarter. You can see where it says doorway and this weird feature that they think it wasn't a barrel but it was probably a bucket. Um, it didn't turn out to be a barrel when we did the, the reanalysis. But it's right in front of the doorway. What's up with that? You know, what is up? Why would you do that? I could understand if, you, if, if it was a barrel and it was at the corner of the building as a kind of cistern, but why in front of the doorway? So, and the other thing was, and here you can see it. If you look in this image, you can see the unit in front of the doorway and notice over to the right of the unit, you can see the door and you can see like the threshold into the quarter and then you see the excavation unit. And in the bulk of the excavation unit, it's kind of a light brown. But as you look over in sort of that corner on the right hand side, see how very dark it is? I mean, this is the wood that has run, that, that has rotted out. And when she excavated it, when she removed it, she found a brick and you can see sort of the 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 ghost image of where the um bucket was was sitting underneath and it's kind of hard to tell but do you see that triangular thing that is an uh an indian or a native american projectile point now after surveying Soderley, i know that there aren't many projectile points on this property so it's really interesting somebody found that and brought it and put it under this bucket um, there are no Native American artifacts other than this around this quarter. There are elsewhere on the property. So this was really very interesting. And then Jessica Newworth, while she was writing, uh, while she was reporting on this, she said she also found large corroded metal fragments um, with, that were associated with this feature. And she said that she left them in place I looked through our images. I, she didn't take any pictures of these corroded images or these, these pieces of iron. Um, but she said one measured half a foot by about a quarter of a foot. So that is a sizable chunk of iron. Otherwise, she said very little about them and she backfilled them. Now you have to remember, this is back in the 90s. People aren't really 
haven't really gotten into the study of these quarters in the way that they that you know 25 years later and that's why we go back and look at these collections so i started looking around they might find buckets on you know talking to people and at Y Plantation on Maryland's Eastern Shore, they found some worked white marble. They found an iron wheel. Uh, it was in the west facing doorway where a building housing enslaved Africans had once stood. Under the southern side, that was on the west side, on the southern side of the building, they found buried tools, including a hoe blade, a wood splitter, and a shovel head. Um, and archaeologist Elizabeth Pruitt, who was working for archaeology in Annapolis at the time, she argues that these items and their suspected association may have served as a form of protection for the structure. She noted that iron tools became emblematic for their protective qualities um, of the Arisha or minor god um, and were used as symbols by herbalists and practitioners who would call upon this uh, power in Africa. Um, and she and she thought that maybe these hoe blades or hatchet blades that have also been found in the doorways of quarters at Kingsley Plantation in Florida, Cooper Plantation in Georgia, and the Indian Rest Cabin in Calvert County that was found there by archaeologist Kirsty Unala. Um, she thought that these might, Elizabeth Pruitt and Kirsty thought that these might in fact be uh, protective charms. Um, and below this cache um, that was found at the Indian Rest Quarter, they found a cache of objects, and then below it, they found an iron hoe. And Wyoni Edwards, who's an archaeologist with the Colonial Williams um, Foundation, she also cites an oral history of a former enslaved man named Henry Rogers, who described how they would hide charms in the front, in the ground in front of their cabin to render those people who were approaching the cabin friendly and peaceful, even if they were originally coming not in a friendly and peaceful manner. Um, so this is all really interesting. If it is a bucket, and I looked up, you know, what about buckets? And I found in an African-American folktale, Br'er Rabbit, many of you may have heard of it, the quintessential, Br'er Rabbit is the quintessential trickster figure uh, in African-American folklore. And he convinces Br'er Fox to rescue him from a well. Br'er Rabbit has fallen into a well um, by telling Br'er Fox that the moon reflected in the water of the well is actually a block of cheese. So Br'er Fox jumps into what's called a, must be a reciprocating uh, well bucket. He jumps into the bucket that's up to go down to get the cheese. And meanwhile, Br'er Rabbit is lifted to his freedom. So Br'er Rabbit is sort of this trickster who succeeds by his wits um, rather than necessarily by his brawn. Um, and he provokes authority figures and he bends social mores to, as he sees fit. And so it's really kind of interesting, I think, that, you know, Br'er Rabbit is moving to his freedom. Now, I realize that I am out in speculation territory big time, but it is through this kind of creative speculation that we start to come up with the kinds of questions where we go back into the data and we ask, can that support this kind of interpretation? Um, and finally, um, I want to tell you, we're back to the map of the um, slave quarter. And this unit is located inside the slave quarter. And, and the, um, Jessica wanted to excavate it because a lot of times you will find um, these what are called subfloor pits. They're like cellars um, dug in front of the hearth. Sometimes they're just a, a hole that's dug to maintain, to keep vegetables. Other times they are used to keep all sorts of personal possessions because these are, are crowded facilities. There's all sorts of reasons. Um, and there's been a lot of people who've studied and tried to interpret them. And some of the things that she found, she only dug the first couple top layers. And she found that, that in fact, there was a pit. And then from the top of that pit, look at all of this seed material that she got. I mean, this is extraordinary. And it's not listed here, but she also got eggshells because of the dry conditions of the, um, of, of, the uh, um, of the slave cabin. Um, and so that was really very interesting. And then she also found 
this bat's foot, which in some cultures is seen as a harbinger of death. So is this just a bat that got loose in the cabin after it had been abandoned, it was no longer used? Or is it something that was used by the people? One of the questions we'd wanna ask is, are there other bones associated with the bat? That would suggest maybe the bat got lost in the cabin, you know, flew into the cabin and got trapped and couldn't get out. But it's very, very interesting that these seeds, there, there's just a lot more questions that, you know, archeology span never ever gets the answer. It gets questions. That's why a lot of people think that we're just a very expensive uh, 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 bling ourselves. But I have to tell you, we get to resources that other people cannot get to through documents. And finally, also found at the slave cabin was a Civil War button, which is kind of interesting and exciting. It probably dates to 1840 to 1850. It was a standard issue um, infantry but button. Um, it's got an eagle uh, with an eye in the center that stands for in infantry. We know from oral history that Walter Hanson Briscoe would sometimes go to Leonardtown in a Union uniform. Um, this was found at the quarter. Why is it there? Um, we don't necessarily know except to say that it is there. And we do know that there were a lot of buttons found around the quarter. Um, and you can see the units around the quarter and the number of buttons that were found in each. And I suspect that these buttons are showing up at the quarter through laundry activities um, and or else recycling of um, clothing for quilts and that kind of thing. Again, the kinds of questions that, you know, that we'll, we, we should do a deep dive or possibly even come back to the quarter at some point. And then something else at the quarter, um, we found this really interesting little ceramic. This is whiteware, by the way. And you can see it's got an embossed R on it. And it probably came from a plate like this, an alphabet plate. And we also saw, these were recovered by Jessica, a slate pencil. Now, normally I'd say, this isn't that unusual. You'll find slate pencils here and there. You'll find pieces of alphabet plates. But I talked to my colleague, uh, Tricia Stanford, who studies alphabet plates. And she's told me, and she's done a survey of alphabet plates throughout Southern Maryland. And she says that they are almost without exception found at the homes of either newly freed uh, enslaved people, people are newly freed like post bellum or in quarters. Um, and so this combination really, I think speaks volumes about acts of resistance. Um, there was a story of poisoning at Soderley in 1738 that I didn't tell you about because we don't have any archaeological evidence, but there were two um, enslaved people, Judy and Pompey, who attempted to poison the overseer and I think the gardener, and they were executed for their um, act. There's also running away as a form of resistance, self-emancipation as a form of, re of resistance, the likely use of popular beliefs and folk applications, and, and education. So all of these things become part of the toolbox, um, you know, to a, attempt to build a better life, what we might call, you know, the life that's promised people as, uh, as Americans. I'm gonna wrap up with this last image or la last couple of images. Um, this shows the 18th century layout, we think, of the Soderley Plantation. You can see the circular driveway and slightly see the roof of Soderley House. Each one of these black dots represents where we think there was an 18th century quarter. Um, and you can see the one that's white, we think it might be a quarter, we're not 100% sure about, about that. But after 1820, and when I, I say 1820, it could have been 1814, but we, are, we have to sort of stick with the dates that our ceramics give us. So check this out, watch this. And then the next um, image, you see a realignment. Quarters now are along roads. Quarters are where people can be more easily surveilled. They're not hidden away in an area that's dissected by ravines that nobody's really going to. Might've been a great use for bowls and plater to use that land because they weren't farming it, but it became a way that uh, they lost uh, what they would have considered a tremendous amount of their property. So this helps us see Soderley not just as this fixed structure, but that it is in fact an evolving structure. 
Um, so that is uh, that is pretty much what I have to tell you tonight. And there's so much more, but uh, and, and there's more to tell you also about the other families that lived here, not just uh, the the planters family, but also the people who lived here in the 20th century. But um, there, it's it's just too much for one sitting. I'm happy to share. Any of you like to contact me um, offline um, later? I'd be happy to share a copy of the report for you. Um, Nancy, Jean, thank you so much for inviting me. Audience, thank you so so much for inviting me. If you all have any questions, um, I'm happy to um, uh, address them. And I'll go ahead and stop the slide presentation now. Thank you, Dr. King. Um, if a reminder, if you have questions, please put them in the chat and we will cover as many as we can. Okay, so I'll give you a little time to do that. Carolyn uh, Gardner says, uh, Julia, hope you are well. Has anyone tried to locate the grave of George Plater III? That is a great question. And that was one of the great stories to tell, but I don't think it's my story to tell, but let me tell you, they're working on it and there may be a story to tell in the future. So I would say stand by. Okay, and Karen Gruber asked, what is next for archeological research at Sodery? Oh my gosh, there's just so much that can be done there. I mean, you know, the funding that we had from the trust was limited. It was it was it was thirty thousand dollars, and in archaeology, that's nothing. Um, but we were we were able to squeeze as much out of the shovel test and the um, uh, existing collections. Um, but we can go back into those collections. So I would, you know, I would I would hope that students would be really interested in going back into those co collections and saying, hey, does she have it right about this bucket thing, or is she just out there speculating. Um, what was life like? You know, can we look at the animal bones and get a sense of what people were consuming? How ritzy was life in the big house? Um, what's that weird 18th century thing doing down there in that corner that, that seems, uh, I realize that my talk with my hands and stand down hands. Um, so there's a lot more to do. The issue is that it is archaeology is very ex expensive and it and it is grant funded so i'm hoping that you know we'll continue to look for grants um but there is no place more deserving of you know archaeological research to pair it with the interpretations that Satterley is doing okay thank you okay dante eubanks have have the land surveys shown more grave sites for the enslaved so, you know, finding when you use shovel test, and that's that is a great question, but when you use shovel test, it's like one little teeny hole. You only go down about a foot because you just want to get the artifacts. Um, so you don't really, you can't even tell if you're on top of a grave. You can't necessarily tell if you are. Now, I will tell you that the oral history um, that uh, that Sam has, I think it's online pretty sure it is online, um, talks about where some of these other um, possible slave cemeteries are. And I think ground penetrating radar, which really puts it into a different realm. I'm not a, I'm not a person who, I mean, I, I hire people who do ground penetrating radar. I don't really use ground penetrating. I mean, I don't, I can't do it myself, but that's the way to figure out where it is. Um, I would say as you look, it's sort of a negative thing, right? If you look and there's a lot of artifacts, well, there's probably not a graveyard there, right? Because people don't eat in graveyards. Um, you know, it's, so usually you don't find a lot of artifacts. So I would start by saying, where do we not find a lot of artifacts? And then and then look at that area as a, so how's that for a non-answer? You know, you know what my poor students have to put up with. <laughs> it's in the book. Uh <laughs> Raymond uh, asked, have the findings been published yet? So I did complete a report. And um, if you want to send uh, Jean or, or Satterley or me, um, and I'm going to go ahead and put my email into the, um, into the chat box. 
I would be happy to send you a copy of the report. So. Okay. So Robert asked, Thompson Furniture is, is the location of Four Mile Run Episcopal Church. Uh, where is the Plater family buried there? Oh boy, that's another great question. Um, I believe, and I'm going to have to be dredging this out of my memory of the oral history, but I think when Sam was trying to model where the Plater grave might be, um, he had looked at some work there, and I think 235 may have taken out the grave there, um, or the graves there. Um, now, I don't know as much about that, so maybe, Jean, if that's something you could address, but I... I just remember that that was a possibility, but it couldn't pan out because of the survey I think Regina Hammett had done. Uh, and if I'm remembering this wildly wrongly, go ahead and correct me. Um, that That's still an argument we still have. I mean, um, uh, were the, uh, you know, we, we, we know that there was a, there used to be a, um, you know, a chapel there. The, on, and then it was Soderley property because Soderley used to be huge. So the, the, the one theory is that uh, uh, e even if George Plater was buried there, that still would have been Soderley then. Um, and then there's people like Sam who don't agree with that assessment. So so this will go on and on until we have definitive <laughs> evidence. <laughs> but every time a tree blows over, we look for George Plater. <laughs> Well, I have to tell you that Saturday maybe one day can have a grave, a, a cemetery summit, you know, and get, get all the parties yeah. into the same room yeah. and, and brainstorm, you know, duke it out and then brainstorm. Right, right. Okay, let me look for some more questions. Karen asks, did you locate any middens or dry wells? We found lots of middens, no dry wells. Um, we found lots of, I mean, the way an archaeologist defines a midden, it's really just where you threw stuff out in the yard and it builds up. So there's there are huge middens around the main house. I didn't talk about the main house because it wasn't a focus, although the main house was also, you know, people worked, enslaved people worked in there, and they also slept in there. So, you know, in some ways, cutting it out is really an artificial thing to do. But we found middens on both sides, on the riverside and the roadside, and you can actually see the house turn, you can see where the way the middens are distributed, you can see um, people move sort of from a, <clears throat> a river orientation to a street orientation um, based on the location of the middens. But everywhere you sink a shovel in the ground, you're going to come up with refuse at Soderley. So I would say there are middens everywhere, some okay. of them than others. For, um, for those that aren't uh vocabulary savvy can you explain really quickly what a midden is a midden is basically just a buildup of refuse you know people didn't have concepts of germs or disease so they would often just throw their their refuse their garbage out in the yard i mean it's a big payday for archaeologists um and then it would build up you know chickens and and uh pigs might root in it um people walk on it so it gets broken up but it builds up over time and, uh, and so most of our archeological sites um, are actually in the zone that we call the plow zone, right? Because it's been plowed since, not at Soderley, but parts of, you know, parts of Soderley have been plowed. So, so a midden is really just a buildup of refuse. Thank you. So Kent asked, I have heard the realignment of slave quarters explained as a result of 1831 Nat Turner rebellion. It is interesting to consider the role of the 1814 self-emancipations. Do you think Nat Turner's played a role in the realignment of at Soderley 17 years after the 1814 emancipation? I would say that, well, first of all, as you, as everyone who follows the Nat Turner, I mean, Nat Turner had a huge impact on the psyche. I mean, there was already impacts on the psyche. When you're holding people in bondage, you can pretty much assume that, you know, they're not going to like like their situation. Um, I would say um, in this particular case, I would 
I would link it to not the platers so much because the platers are sort of imploding by the early 19th century. The family is, seems to be imploding. Um, there's efforts by relatives to keep it together, um, but just the absence of that, that, that whiteware. Whiteware is so cheap and it is so common. The fact that it's, it pretty much is gone from that, um, that, 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 area up on the top of the ravines um, suggests to me that that alignment is happening earlier. And I believe, and Jean, you can correct me, I do believe that isn't it in the 20s that the Briscoes come into... Uh, 1826. It's, uh, uh, Emmeline is here before that, about three years before that, but um, but uh, yeah, the Briscoe ownership starts 1826. And I think the Briscoes are probably looking at the platers having imploded. And I know that there's um, uh, Emmeline's father, who's uh, or stepfather, that's that's there in between for a little bit. But I think that you know Walter Briscoe is a man who is very involved with agricultural um, innovation and uh, reform, and uh, and I suspect that it's all part of that. And that he, the minute he gets here, he starts. Uh, if, it, if rearranging hasn't already been going on, he starts with rearranging. Okay. Dante asks, what can the Soderly descendants and community members do to rally support for continued, continued archaeological research? Oh my God, just by saying that, you rally my spirit that maybe we could, you know, could do something. I mean, you know, there's so many needs for Soderly. And the beauty about archaeology is, is that if you don't, if you leave it in the ground, it's been there for 200 years, it'll be fine. So when you do finally go to dig, you want to make sure that you have the resources to do it. And I certainly think that, um, uh, you know, talking to the kind of funding that's needed for archaeology needs to come from deep pocketed individuals. And I usually see that as the state the federal government, or even the county, right? You know, the, their grant, those granting agencies. Um, and so I think that, you know, they're a, a concerted publicity PR campaign about what we're learning um, and how it's contributing, um, just because there are so many needs. So you don't want to say, well, just do our arche only archaeology at Soderley. Soderley has like a thousand other needs. But, um, but we should talk let's let's we should get together and talk about this we should have an archaeology summit too <laughs> after our cemetery summit uh i just thought uh there's sam he's talking about where um he believes uh george player the third is buried so see that the the discussion continues hi yeah. sam um let's see uh carolyn says julia um are you planning uh, ground penetrating ground penetrating radar at Soderley or at St. Francis Xavier Church? So there has been ground penetrating radar at Soderley, and I don't think that the results are ready for prime time yet. Um, so uh, there has been, and um, and it too is expensive. Um, and St. Francis Church, I mean, I, I, that's like not my project. So I don't know, I know Jim Gibb was working over there, so maybe um, he would, um, but there, you know, you bring in the radar when the, the, the geophysical guy, um, and I use this one guy, a guy named uh, uh, Tim Horsley, but there are others who do really good work. Um, when you have narrowed things down, right? Because it takes a long time. So if you think this is, possibly a cemetery or you think there's a house here. Um, but again, um, you know, it, it, we're talking to do just even a small survey can be ten to $20,000. Sonia has a question. How do you feel about shovel testing in general? They do a lot of damage, but I don't think um, there is a better way to acquire this kind of spatial data right now. Oh, absolutely. I mean, shovel tests are not, they're not as damaging as you think because most of Soderley has been plowed, right? So the plows already come through and, and churned it up and the plows already broken up the artifacts. So yeah, when you're digging a shovel test, you might come down on a ceramic and break it. Um, that doesn't happen as often as you think it would, but um, 
so when it's a plow zone, I, you know, what's the trade off? Never know or go in there with a trowel. I didn't have it. Um, you know, so shovel testing really is the best. Now, some archaeologists, and I, I disagree with them on this, they think if you just plow the field again and walk, you know, and then surface collect. But the problem with that at a place like Sodderley and a place like that anywhere in Southern Maryland is you have buried deposits. And, and when you plow a site, you're not going to get, um, the buried deposits aren't going to come up. So yeah, it, I mean, there have been the, the shovel incised artifacts, but that comes even when you're digging five by five foot units in plow zone. So it, it is a, it's, it's a trade-off. Okay, Eric has a question. Uh, any thoughts about the whiteware uh, hits in the in the STPS in the in the southeastern area of the property? So you know, archaeologists have ex explanation for everything. Uh, some <laughs> vocabulary there, I know. <laughs> so, so it, Eric's asking, "Hey, you sh there were some shovel tests you didn't talk about, and I saw whiteware in them. So, what's up with them?" And so, notice how I conveniently didn't talk about them. So I have, I have an, an insider who knows, um, but this is how I would explain that. And I don't think this is a good explanation, but a lot of planners starting in the 19th century would use something called night soil. They would take soil out of privies and spread it on fields. And so sometimes in those field, in those privies, you would find artifacts. And so what you'd have to look at is the, are the artifacts just sort of randomly spread across the field or are they clustered? And if they're clustered, that suggests that that somebody's living there. And if they are randomly spread out, that suggests that somebody's spreading night soil. But no, you raised some really good good points. And to go back to Sonia's question, shuttle tests are great, but you can only push them so far. Okay, um, William asks a good question. Welcome, William. Are there any records of emancipated persons who came from Sodderley, perhaps descendants in the area? And I'll tell you that, oh yes. <laughs> and some of them are uh, in the chat right now and are joining us right now. So um, we have a, a really uh, fine group of descendants that have identified uh, voluntarily. And um, we have lists of enslaved, um, uh, and those that were emancipated in 1864. So, um, uh, William, if you think you, uh, might be a descendant of either owners or enslaved or free laborers, uh, go to our website, download a form and send it to us. We'd love to, uh, have you join us. Uh, did you have anything to add to that, Julia? No, I think that, that you're the person. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, Sam asked, didn't a plow pull up a coffin lid? Well, I think, Sam, that's in your oral history. And I think that was in another area. I feel like this is Sam's story to tell. So, but I do think in, in one area that was a possibility for a, uh, a burial that there was, you know, somebody reported having found uh, coffin hardware, um, somebody who had grown up on the property. And uh, so, so yeah, I mean, and it's clues like that. These clues, you know, that's how it'll be found. I mean, it's a great, you know, who needs CSI? You know, when you can, you can do, do CSI in history, right? Okay, Trudy, another one of our descendants out in California. Is there any evidence of ironware in your finds and how are they dated? So are you asking for like iron stone, which is a type of ceramic, or are you asking for actually like pieces of iron, like a, a frying pan? You want to say something, say that in the, uh, in the chat? You just yeah. let, us, let us know which one, Trudy, can yeah. you add to the chat? Did you hear her? And ironstone is just a type of ceramic that's like 1830s. We didn't find much ironstone. It's uh, like kind of interesting, actually. And we didn't. We found some metal objects, but um, again, shovel tests will only take you so far. 
Jessica, if you remember, Jessica said she had seen those iron items in the in the units that she was digging, but she left them and reburied them. But what we know is that they're still there because she left them, so we can go back and get them if we need to. Okay. Uh, pieces of iron, Trudy says. Piece of, yeah, there's some. Um, and this piece of, there are lots of pieces of iron. If you remember, Jean, the gate material, the gate, the gate latches that Joe had found, um, they were on the surface of the ground, but again, part of the story of Soderley. Okay, Charles has a question. Has Soderley identified any descendants of those who self-emancipated in 1814? If so, where are they living? Well, I think you covered that, Julia, a little bit, but I'll reiterate. Uh, we have a list of those who self-emancipated from records of, of the owners trying to uh, get reparations for lost property. And we know that uh, most of the bigger group uh, ended up in Halifax, Nova Scotia. And, um, and uh, the, uh, another group went to Trinidad. But yes, this is another lifetime of work finding, connecting to these descendants. So if any of you out there go to Halifax uh, and go researching, uh, would love to connect to some of these descendants that I'm sure still live there. Um, I, I have been fishing. I haven't been to Halifax, though. So if any anybody takes a trip, you know, and wants to do a little research, um, for us, we would love that. But yes, we're still on the, uh, we're always looking for uh, descendants wherever they may be. So thank you for that question. Okay, I think um, I don't see any more questions. So uh, thank you, thank you, Julie. And I'm gonna turn it back over to Nancy. Thank you all. Well, I agree with David uh, Dederick, who said, you are a gift to your students, and tonight you have been a gift to us. Oh. You know, there is so much more that Julie has that she could share. Seriously, we could do a semester <laughs> of this, I think. And there's so much more about the Native American population, which Julie didn't have time for. Really, there's a lot more of all these stories. And as she was saying, and, and I loved that... Um, one of another of our descendants, Jerome Spears, picked up on it. He loved in his comment, if I can find it, he mentioned the fact that he loved the fact that this is just creating more research questions. And so often that's what you're finding. But if um, I think that what you have given us shows us where we know something is going on and even the places where there aren't, that's got stories too. So I love everybody who's asking, how can we do more archaeology? Well, funding, 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 funding. So <laughs> we can solve that puzzle. We can have a lot more research done. There are so much to find out about those whose lives are intertwined. But, so, uh, but certainly, Julie, your um, wonderful presentation tonight gave us so much to think about. We're so grateful to you for sharing it with everybody. We have, um, so I'm glad you all joined us tonight. We have another wonderful presentation coming up. In fact, Trudy, who is in our chat tonight, is going to be doing our next two-part event later this month. So you can sign up for Trudy's wonderful Common Ground programming coming up at the end of October. It'll be a two-night special. And she, along with all of our other descendants are part of the reason that we were so honored to to win as julie mentioned the underground railroad free press leadership award for the work that's being done and our with common ground and our descendants uh, our descendant community julie thank you for continuing to being a solderly treasure we thank you so much for everything you do for us Thank you all for joining us tonight. Thank you to the Maryland Humanities and Maryland Heritage Area Authority, to the Maryland Historical Trust who funded the work that Julie was referring to, and for all of you for being part of tonight's presentation. Good night, one and all. Thank you for coming. Thank you.